put on the full armor of God. So I cannot tell you how profoundly, I'm going to go with happy I was when I finally woke this morning out of a night long series of night terrors, or I should say night terrors and experiences. And nothing hit me more uh, deeper than the Holy Spirit saying, put on the full armor of God. In other words, I knew that this morning I was gonna wake up, at least my plans, and that's laughable. If you think you have plans other than what Holy Spirit has for you, think again. But the thought was, <clears throat> I have Bible study today, and I was asked to do a Bible study for some people on a certain topic, and that was my plan. I was gonna spend the entire day on that topic to prepare for a Bible study. Um, but that got derailed. I still have hours. I've been at this video I'm doing right now. I've been at it for more than five hours, five and a half hours now. And I'm going to now make the video and then I'll, I'll turn back to the Bible study. And I still have four or five hours to do the Bible study. So that's still time. But the point is, I hope that you, you get how profound and the, the, that the, the whole put on the full armor of God and how lackadaisical, at least for me, I will confess right here and now, how lackadaisical I was in understanding, let alone putting on the full armor of God. And if you're like me, you too are lackadaisical. You too do not on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, on a weekly, maybe monthly, maybe even yearly basis, ever think about the armor of God. So while I, of all people, I know this, you know, basically, having lived my life entirely with the supernatural encounters. I've talked about that in all of my videos, nearly, all right? I have supernatural anointing and I have encounters daily. It's been part of my life. I do not know anything, right, uh, until I was rescued. Until I was rescued, I spent an entire life in the supernatural knowing nothing about the full armor of God. Or even that there was an armor, right? Or that there was even a battle with the devil on a not only daily basis, but on an individual strategic basis. And that the devil has demons and an eternal place of suffering called hell and the lake of fire. I knew none of this. Now, what little time I admit that I spent in church or in Sunday school in my upbringing, or even as you know a young adult, luckily I did go to Bible camp one year in which I did answer the altar call and I was baptized by my own free will. God knows our end from the beginning. Before the foundation of the earth, he knows my soul. He knows my life. He's got my book. I'm written in it. And thankfully, I had that authority in me, but not really understood or known by me at the time. And it saved me and got me to where I am today. So fast forward. Here we are today. It is April 22, 2024. Now, I've been rescued for over just, just under three years. September will be my three-year anniversary. So, since I was rescued, I've been reading the Bible every day and loving my time in the Word, right? I dive into the root Hebrew and Greek meaning of everything that I'm reading. And not once, literally, not once did I really, with every cell of my being, understand or really honestly ever give time or thought to what I know, I memorize, I know it in my heart and soul, Ephesians 6, 12, what the whole armor of God meant. Well, that's really Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. But you know what I mean, the famous Ephesians 6, 12. So, having gone through what I did last night, I will now go through the concordance uh, on Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. But first, let me tell you my experience because... I am not 
but as an example for you. Okay, this isn't something personal to me. I'm just an example, all right? For you to tell you this is gonna happen. Uh, it's going to happen to every person in a different individual strategic way because the devil has his strategy on you. But it's going to happen to every person on the planet. Even those who are God-fearing, right? For, for without the full armor, it's not just a verse we read. It's action and it's daily, if not hourly, moment by moment action. That without it, you're not going to be over, or I should say, I'm sorry, you will not be able to overcome the physical weight of evil that's coming unto our lives. Uh, you need to hear that with more than a grain of salt, the physical weight of evil. Man, is that going to be real? Is that going to consume you? I got a foreshadow. I got a tasting of it last night. And there's a reason that I'm being used as an example, right? There is a reason for that. We all have our placement in the book. We all have our role. We all have our experience to share and to further educate and help and fortify the body of Christ, all right? Each of us individually are being targeted and attacked by the devil, and individually we will grow, we will overcome, and we will fortify, and we will go forward in the body of Christ as an example and as a leader and as a testimony, as a witness, as a true and faithful witness and servant. So having said that, so the night terrors has gone on my entire life. And the Holy Spirit has been talking to me on what became, right, when I started talking about the night terrors, when I started understanding how to overcome the night terrors, I started with that in a video put out, I don't know, a week or two ago, but it's called Cursed, part one. I've been too busy in battle to get to part two. Maybe I'll get to that this week. I don't know. But the, the, the amping up of night terrors over the last two weeks is for a reason. What I have learned in order to begin to battle it, overcome it, fight it, uh, go through it with a peace of mind and listen to the Holy Spirit, in order to do that, Every night, I sit at the table that you see right there, my dining room table. You see my Bible there. And I sit there, and I have five different scriptures. And all five scriptures, I read them three times each. Before I read the scripture, I say, it is written. And when the scripture is done, I say, it is written. That, that dissipates. It terrorizes the demons, and it gets the darkness away. So... Again, I read it before the verse and after the verse. And because of that, I've been free of night terror. And having been freed, or or maybe it's at times I can step aside and I'm lucid with the Holy Spirit teaching me something. Right, The Holy Spirit is teaching me and taking me through spiritual realms right, without fear. And with my ability to feel strong and my authority and fight the good fight and win, you know, with ease, with, with peace of mind. That was not the case last night. As I started to fall asleep, I suddenly remembered I forgot to sit in front of my Bible. I forgot to read the verses verbatim. I picked, that you know, verbatim that I picked precisely for me. For my particular, you know, what I know my weakness is that the devil can strategize against me, that Satan and his demons can use against me. Holy Spirit helped me to find scriptures precisely for me, and they work. And so it helps to get rid of my fears and my weakness, right? We all have them in this world, right? That's a guarantee. We have fears and weaknesses in that world, which is why... God gave us his precise words to get us through this darkness. We are in disguise, right? We are in this darkness. This world is full of darkness. And it's disguised, as you well know, I always say, as love, light, and high vibrations. 
As I was falling asleep, I tried my best to quote the chosen scriptures for me, and I simply shortened them to the basic facts. And the basic facts of my scriptures is, is simply, as I lie down, I will sleep in safety because my nighttime has never been safe. Whether I am taken physically, and I have been thousands of times, whether I'm taken out of body, I've been taken out of body asleep and in a waking state, and others have witnessed it. Or I'm in a lucid state and spiritual realms, all right? And I cannot wake up, except lately when I do, um, because I have said the scriptures verbatim. In other words, now I have that power and that authority because I have been using the scriptures, but last night I fell asleep without doing that. I got distracted. I allowed myself to get distracted. I allowed sleep to come on me too fast, and I didn't go to the Bible first and foremost. So, I didn't have the full armor of God as I did. I don't know if it was the night before last night or, or before two nights before that, whatever it was. And I, I did a video on it. I don't remember what it was called, but I did had read the Bible that night. And that night I was put in a situation where I was fighting snakes and dragons. And I had the full of party. I had peace of mind. Peace, peace was in my soul. I was fine. And I could feel the Holy Spirit presence next to me. Last night was the worst ever that I can ever recall. I did not for a second think I could fight what came over me. I had no authority. I had no no battle instruments. I had no peace in my heart whatsoever. The thing that came upon me physically, the dark, the evil thing that came upon me physically, the heaviness of it, it was not a dream. It was real life. And I'm telling you this only because I am a foreshadow. It's going to happen to everyone. We are all in this together. You are not exempt. Now, if you followed my videos, you know that one of my anointings is always looking at every single story and every single uh, encounter, whatever it is in the Bible, I can always see it as a foreshadow. There's nothing new under the sun. And in all of my videos, I've always pointed that out. Everything is a foreshadow. What will be, will be again. And I am a foreshadow for you. And so I hope that you prepare yourself and understand uh, the full armor of God. Now, my experience was an entity and a dark covered cloak. What do they call that? Is that the, uh, you know, that dark cloak guy with the hood? I, there's a word for it. I can't even think what it is. It doesn't matter. Okay. It was big. It was heavy. It was dark. It was evil. And it was stronger than life. It was like I encountered this, the strength of an ox, the size of a, what is those bisons or buffaloes? You know, big animals, but it was in a human form. Its strength was beyond human. It did not need like arms or legs to consume me, right? It was the weight of it. It was the weight of darkness. It was immediate physical sensation like a house just fell on me. All right, does that sound familiar, right? Wizard of Oz, what's our earliest programming on little kids here? That house falling on you will be real one day. It, I am just a foreshadow. Now I was given mercy and I was able to wake myself up and escape this night terror. And I will never again take my nighttime prayers lightly verbatim out of the scripture, out of the word of God. But what that did was a Holy Spirit, I guess I would say a Holy Spirit teaching me the rest of the night about the deeper meaning of the full armor. So let me share with you what I know now, right? I can only know now what I know today, right? My onion, my layers have been peeled to this certain place today, April 22, 2024, next week, next month, next year, I'll be in a different place. God willing, I'm still here. 
highly doubtful, but this is what I know to be true today. Now let's read the full armor of God. Holy Spirit has instructed me as always to do this exegetically. And instead of reading what has to be the to, to, what has to be the only for me, right? Having experienced what I did to not use my understanding, really ever. But let's look to our Bible stories for the meaning, for it is our foreshadow. It's our history. And it's all we have to lean on, not our understanding, but those God chose to fight his fight in this dark kingdom. Those are our brethren, all right? Abraham, Lot, David, so those are our brethren. Aaron, Joshua, those are our brethren. Let's lean on them. Let's look to them for understanding our role today, our fight today, our armor today. They are our foreshadow. Let's go to those stories and understand, you know, let's use that. All right, so never, ever, ever, ever go on your wisdom. That's just vanity of vanities. Let's get started. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. All right, there's one word here that is key. That, that word is power. Let's look at power. There are literally 100 in your in today's mindset and our knowledge today, just off the top of our head, we could use the examples of the word power in a hundred different ways. So let's go look to power in scripture. All right, you can do that one word study. The word power in scripture has 260 verses. But for me here, I'm putting on the full armor of God. What stood out for me was in 1 Corinthians 118. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now that's power. Now you can you can look at the other 259 verses of power, and you can think about power in your own in your own life and your own mindset. But if you think anything is going to give you power beyond 1 Corinthians 1:18. You need to stop, pause right now, and just stick with that until you understand what that's saying. Only the preaching of the cross gives you the power of God. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we will break down the whole armor piece by piece, but here in this verse to note is the wiles of the devil. Wiles in the concordance means schemes. So here we know that the devil, Satan, the dragon, the snake in the garden, has an individual plan, hear me now, an individual plan for each of us. For we are all unique in our weakness of flesh and our walk with God. And it differs by the hour. His demons and his dark angels are recording us by the minute and know right they know when to pounce every minute of every day if not just in our thoughts which will eventually of course lead to action those actions will of course lead to addiction because everything grows like a fungus like a weed all right this indicates this tells us that there was a coordinated plan of attack against believers. Here, Paul does not have in mind physical violence. Paul is telling us this is a spiritual battle, right? He's going to explain it in the next verse, Ephesians 6, 12. The devil appears to be specifically seeking to destroy the good work of all believers. Thankfully, right, the devil's power is no match for the power available through God. But believers must pray and be fully reliant on God's resources, right? To stand firm. 
we will read that again in a further verse, Ephesians 6, 13. So God's resources, we need to stand firm against his attacks. Using the armor of God fully is, to, is the key, is the, the key to surviving the spiritual onslaught. The restrainer is going to be let loose and the spiritual onslaught is going to be on the surface. There'll be no veil. There'll be no hiding or turning your head, sticking your head in the sand. There'll be no running. There'll be no getting away. There will only be the armor of God. And this is our future. You and me, we're in the last generation. Our kids, our grandkids, the last generation. This is what is going on. Let's not put our heads in the sand. Let's read on. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness <clears throat> of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Through the concordance, break that down. Principalities is the number 746. It means the beginning, the origin of angels and demons to rule and lead. The word powers is number 1849. It means authority over mankind, as I read to you in part one and part two, Psalm 82. It means superior to man to be able to pass judgment on man and to manage domestic affairs. In other words, they rule us and are given permission to do so for an appointed time. We humans are subject to those fallen angelic powers. Next, in Ephesians 6, 12, is the word rulers of darkness. Rulers is the number 2888. It means Lord of this world, Prince of this age, the devil and his demons. Ephesians 6, 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you will be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. It is a reminder that in our spiritual battle, God will win the victory. We are not called on to charge against Satan, but to endure his attacks until Christ wins the ultimate triumph. Those who put on the full armor of God are promised certain benefits. The evil day can refer to any moment of a spiritual attack. It does not refer to a future last day scenario. Believers are to constantly be on guard, living prepared with God's armor. Also, believers who wear God's armor can stand firm. A phrase used in connection with success with God in the Old Testament. Now you can read that yourself. I can't read all of the verses. But I will read Exodus 14, 13. In addition, read 2 Chronicles 20, 17, Psalm 89, 28, Isaiah 46, 8, Daniel 11, 32. Again, I'm going to read Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. You all know the Red Sea moment. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I love this one right here. The breastplate of righteousness. I could go on for another 30 minutes on this, but I can't because of time. I'm already kind of over time. So for the Christian, truth is to be securely connected to us for our success. Truth, as Paul defined it, included the accurate information regarding God and the good news of Jesus Ephesians 1 13, Ephesians 4 15, 4 21, and 4 25. All right, I'm just going to read Ephesians 1 13, but from a logical standpoint, this is a, you're an accurate, a sensible statement, which is truth binds together. Everything else we believe without unifying truth, we just have disjointed, disconnected pieces. Now, let me read now Ephesians 1 13 on this. Again, exegetical, as scripture interprets scripture. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, next here is the breastplate. The breastplate is a primary means of identification. This is one 
of the clearer ways for soldiers, Roman soldiers, to recognize each other in battle. All right, it's also a, a symbol, a metaphor for a Christian's behavior. A Christian's behavior is meant to identify them to the world and to the unseen world realm as well. The demons, the fallen angels, see this, your breastplate, as do the people in your, in your realm. So this is for the seen and unseen realm. Understand that with every cell in your being. If you don't, you're going to be unprepared. So, again, this is how you recognize each other in battle. So, believers, meaning followers of Christ. Um, and if you've been following my videos, a good example of this is a recent video I put out called Proverbs 1-7, Satan's Snares. And I talk about the example given at the backyard barbecue. I could, as you know, let me just expand on that. I could immediately see their breastplates in their words. I could see their breastplates in their actions, their body language, their actions, their pleasures of being in and of this world, right? They bragged on their academia, their, their uh, credentials, whatever you want to call it. So just as a recent example, I wanted to throw out there your breastplate should be in constant defense of the word of god think of the breastplate as their clothing is it modest look at their makeup especially the women you know today satan uses women as high priestess do they have a bunch of jezebel colorful you know big time eye makeup you know tammy faye's eyes remember her I can tell you all the female prophets I've ever seen on social media years ago when I looked at that sort of thing for a moment to see what kind of nonsense is out there. They all had Jezebel eyes. They all had big time makeup, normally black, with big time, anyway, Jezebel eyes. I'll leave it at that. So look at that. Everything about a person that you're looking at, you're listening to, their body language, their actions, Everything, they are showing you their breastplate. Is it righteous or not? Period. It comes down to that. Is it righteous or not? What are, they, what are their conversations on? Do they need to speak on things of this world and their desires of the flesh, however small? Really, look around at their breastplates with this lens now. This lens will become a glaring spotlight. They are either for Jesus or against him, period. And your sword will be automatically drawn before you sit among the snakes and the scorpions. When you hold all of the people around you with this lens, see now how your world might change. Ephesians 6, 15, and your feet and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now here is the most precious of all. Here I, I want to read just this one little Ephesians 6.15 here. Your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is beautiful. I put in gospel of peace into the concordance. There's only one verse, so let's read that exegetically. A scripture will always interpret scripture. I knew there would, there would have to be a verse talking about the gospel of peace to explain it. And let's read it. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written. When you come across one of the 80 verses in the entire Bible, and it uses the words as is written, pay it, sit up, read it 3, 4, 12, 20, 100 times. Because it is the most important verses in the Bible. When you see it is written, do a one-word do a one word study. Actually, it's a three-word study. There's 80 verses. I cannot emphasize this enough. Let me repeat, Romans 10, 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So here Paul is making a reference Soldiers 
that are ready to run into battle. The gospel of peace, likewise, makes a believer ready for spiritual battle. Shoes, let's just look at it. it. Really, shoes give you the ability to go almost anywhere. Shoes provide traction, just like the gospel anchors our faith in certain basic universal truths. Without that, we find our foundation slipping. Right? The peace given through the gospel is the answer to most of our daily anxiety. We can cast our cares on God because he cares for us. Right? Something as simple as first. Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So further connecting the concept, right, of shoes with the gospel of peace also is the idea of believers taking the gospel into daily battles, sharing it wherever they go, right? Side note, read Matthew, eight, I'm sorry, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Believers are given the gospel of peace in order to be ready for battle and to help others facing spiritual attack. All right, moving on. Ephesians 6.16. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So the attack is from the evil one, Satan. Jesus teaches us to pray for protection against Satan as the evil one. Matthew 6.13, the Lord's Prayer. Satan cannot be everywhere at once since he is not God. Yet, now he does have demons and fallen angels with us recording and accusing us at all times. But Satan himself, so don't, don't, don't confuse that, what I just said. Satan himself cannot be everywhere, but he has a military, strategic, demonic army that can be and will report to him all of our thoughts, actions, and deeds, as well as report them to God. We will stand before the throne with an accuser angel and our holy angel. So let's not forget that. So while Satan can be everywhere, Paul is saying that Satan attempts to attack every believer he can. Like a military commander, he can attack Christians indirectly through his demons. When we put this into context in Paul's day with how the Roman soldiers use the shield they would stand together and in this way protect not just themselves but those besides them and behind them like a wall okay this is telling us as a body of christ we must surround ourselves with others that have this knowledge that have this faith and readiness to defend the word and attacks from the rise of the evil high priestess we must know Satan's strategy, of which the church body is very unaware. And find your fellow believers. Can I just say, if anybody is in Sedona hearing this, please call me. Because I do not have anybody. Right? My shield does not have any, I don't have any shields on either side of me. In front or behind me. So, if you're a, a soul in Sedona and you, you want to be saved... You want to come to this knowledge? Call me. Just call me. I'll counsel and and sit with you as long as it takes that you become a bride in Christ. Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There is nothing more important than that right there. If you, if you had gone through what I went through last night, and when that heaviness comes upon you, I, 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 I don't even know what to say. Let's, let's break it down. Unbelievably. Let's read it again. Ephesians six seventeen. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. First off, helmet of the concordance is number 4030. Helmet is 4030. What does helmet mean? It literally has nothing to do with the headpiece. In the concordance, it says protection of the soul. No headpiece. But literally your salvation is your soul's protection and none other. And while in battle, it is the and only will be the word of God, not yours. Not yours. Can I say that again? Can I repeat that? Your words are vanity of vanities. During the temptations of Jesus by Satan, Jesus used scripture on all three occasions to overcome temptation. 
He is your example. He leads by example. He gave you how to overcome. All three times, it's found in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Now, those who study and know scripture can best strike back against temptation and prevent the devil from knocking them off their post. All right, take note here. In Matthew 4, 1 to 11, there are three scriptures that I've already said that Jesus uses. And he uses what he says, instead of saying those three scriptures, he only needs to say, it is written. He knows what is written. Satan knows what is written. And Satan has to back down. Jesus doesn't need to use the scripture. All he needs to say is, it is written. And Satan, after three times, bam, gone, done, it's over. It is written. If you cannot think of, of anything other than it is written, think that. Think that. Because at that moment, God will send the Holy Spirit and give utterance into the unseen, evil, dark world that is attacking you. Just know, you will never understand the words. You're never going to memorize the scripture, but you can give utterance. And I'll end it with that. I will end it with give utterance. But in that moment, like I was, completely and totally, the house was upon me. The evil darkness had consumed me. I understood it is written. That I knew. I couldn't get anything else out, but that I knew. And that saved me. Do not discount that. Jesus did that three times for a reason. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that there are specific applications of prayer in this verse and the next. First, Believers are to pray in the spirit. Our prayers are not merely our thoughts about our desires, but are to be done in submission to God. Next, we are to keep alert. While we may not be literally praying every waking second, there is never a good time to set prayer aside. It's a tool we need to have in constant use. I'm going to read here 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 19. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Ephesians 6, verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I cannot say this enough. The understanding and the absolute, all the power and might in that word utterance. That word utterance in the concordance is number 3056. And it says the meaning is the sayings of God. Do you Now do you actually want to use your words instead of asking for utterance? Let's wrap this up. There are five verses with the word utterance and one verse with uttered. Let me read them all. Utterance is so important that it is, once you understand the full armor of God, it is your daily shield, it is your breastplate, it is your shoes, and it is your helmet, and it is your sword. Understand this, this if you, it, you're going to do nothing other than increase in spiritual warfare and battle, and you just need this understanding. I'm going to go with utterance in order, and I'll end with uttered. Utterance, Acts 2, 4. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. 1 Corinthians 1, 5. That in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything in faith and utterance, in knowledge and in all diligence, and your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Now, of course, we just read it in Ephesians 19, 619. End it, utterance with Colossians 4, 3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance 
to speak the mystery of Christ, for which am also in bonds, for which I am also in bonds. That's, that's Paul speaking as he was under house arrest, chained most likely to a Roman soldier or chained in his house. And that's, that's Paul speaking right there. Now, of course, my everyday prayer to go to, period, every day. I say, mostly I say in the shower. For some reason, this is when I enter the shower, I start with Romans 8.26. Every day, every time I take a shower, that I enter the shower with Romans 8.26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself make intersection for us with groanings which cannot be uttered and paul ends ephesians 6 verse 20 for which i am an ambassador in bonds that therein i may speak boldly as i ought to speak paul is telling us here he is declaring god's truth boldly was the right thing to do he did not view being quiet about his faith as honorable Instead, he asked for faith to speak even more boldly about Christ. This was quite honorable and admirable, given the fact that he was already in prison because of his preaching of the gospel. Paul, like us, refused to back down, and he wanted to become even bolder in presenting the good news of Jesus Christ. And this potter... We'll do the same. Amen. Potter out.